It feels like an incredible God moment. There's just a sense here of what we were singing together. And I get that clear impression of God just reaching out to his children saying, you're my beloved. And I'll never let you go. Whenever I'm at a, a new church, a church I've never taken a service at before, I lean towards a particular way of thinking. And that particular way of thinking is discovering your worth, discovering my worth in Christ. Because for many of us, we've grown up with uh, false understandings, sometimes deliberately placed upon us by people who do not have the best at heart for us. And we carry sometimes such huge burdens that sometimes I need to go back to the foundations of what God has really done in my life. We're going to be picking up three readings you know, the one way of doing it is uh, Old Testament and uh, a gospel and an epistle. In this case, we're having three readings from the same gospel, and that's the gospel of Luke. And the word that I want you to listen for starts with a C, and see how that word comes up in each one of those passages. So can we have the first one up? So this is from Luke 8. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now we pick up the second of the stories. Now we've jumped from Luke 8 to Luke 18. And this is the end of Luke 18. And we're reading into the beginning of Luke 19. Remember, you're listening for a word starting with a C. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When the, all the people saw it, they also praised God. So, what if you heard so far, you've heard the two passages, you've heard the one with the woman with the bleeding, and, and she touched Jesus' cloak, she was healed. The second passage that you've heard is the blind guy calling out from the side, asking for help, and we've had Jesus respond to that need. Now moving into 19, Luke 19, Jesus sent to Jericho and was, poor, and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. 
He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. So just out of interest, did you guys pick up the word that comes up every time? That starts with a C. Crowd. You heard it. We'll get to it in a moment or two. But just hold it in the back of your mind for a moment. And you'll see how the uniqueness of the way Jesus engaged with the people uh, transformed things. I think we need to have um, a time of intercession now. Intercession is when you, like, you pray for the needs of those around you, those you're aware of. Bear in mind that there are people who only you are aware are not well today. There are people who you are aware are struggling in their marriage today. You are people, you hear what I'm saying? We have our own personal story. So each one of you has a personal story here. What I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to lead the prayer, then I'm going to leave an open space, and in that quiet, I'm going to encourage you to pray for that person who's precious to you. Um... Even if it's praying for a reconciliation, that's also fine. But what I'm asking you not to do is please don't switch off in the quiet. Please, in the quiet, go to the deepest need that you are aware of. It could even be your own. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you meet us at the deepest point of need in our lives. We thank you that you are the God who continues to care continues to reach out, continues to heal, continues to make whole, continues to restore. We bring a world before you that is environmentally shocking because of how we've treated it. We bring before you uh, rainforests that have just been cut down. We bring before you the, the changes in, in the weather patterns and the melting of ice caps and the, the floods in Houston. And we just see so much that is out of sync and out of kilter in our world. But we pray that you be the God who ministers in those situations and gives your children wisdom as to how to stand up for truth. We pray, Father, for for, for our leaders, our government. We pray that they will stand up for righteousness for all people in this land. We pray, Father, for those who, who are in the armed forces, those who are in the police, those who staff medical facilities, those who have the gift of teaching and lecturing, those who work to restore families. Lord Jesus, we have so many things that we are aware of. And in this quiet moment, we bring before you those who are precious to us. Father, we lift Dudley before you and we pray that your healing would come into his life. We join together now as we say the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So the word that came through uniquely happened to be the word crowds or crowd. And we need to understand what Jesus was doing at that moment. So in the first story, it's the story of the blind man, correct? No, no, the first story is the story of the lady. I'm going to come back to her last. So the second of the stories is the blind man. I want you to imagine that you are in a crowd of people and they're all moving around and you're surrounded by people and Jesus was surrounded by huge crowds. There must have been an awful lot of noise. Who at that moment hears the cry of the desperate blind man? How many of us would have missed that one cry amongst all the others? And yet Jesus shows his unique love of the individual not just everybody but of the individual with your particular need and he reaches out and he brings healing into the blind man's life later we have Zacchaeus um, again picture yourself in a crowd um, coming into one of the stadiums or going out of one of the stadiums or just on a really busy Joburg or Pretoria day when people are just crowding in from every side How many of you, when you're walking through these crowds, are looking up? All of you who look up while you're walking through crowds, please put up your hand and look stupid. It's not a hand, it's a finger. No, well done, though. <laughs> so, what happens is, walking, still, he picks up the deepest need. And the deepest need is, need is Zacchaeus at that moment. And so he reaches out and he spends that evening at Zacchaeus' house. Now come to the woman with the bleeding because this is one of the ones that we don't always... Oh, by the way, does the sound go down and up if I walk? So it's fairly clear. Okay, thank you because uh, I walk. So, so what has happened is now... Come back to the story of the woman with the bleeding. There's something crucial in that. Um, what would it have been? It would have been that gradual ongoing hemorrhaging where, where w w as opposed to three or four days of the month, um, you have the bleeding in this particular time. She has it all the time. Why is it important? Philip, you're standing on unpleasant toes. No, I'm not. I'm making a crucial point. The reason it was so important is because, because she was unclean, she wasn't allowed to go to the synagogue. She wasn't allowed to fellowship with other believers because she was unclean. Because in Leviticus it says, so how long has that been? Has it been, has she had this problem for a few months? She's had it for 12 years. Think back 12 years of your life. Take off the last 12 years and imagine you were never allowed to fellowship with other believers. You were never allowed to attend your church service. You were never allowed to take part in communion. You weren't even allowed to go to a wedding because you were unclean. And so her need is actually huge. The fact that she is healed is the most incredible miracle. But what it is, is now suddenly Jesus feels the touch. So what you've got is you've got him, um, you've got him hearing, you've got him looking up and seeing, and you've got his sense of touch where he felt her touching him. 
in all the cases, the crowd would have thought amongst themselves that they had, each person would have thought their need was the greatest. But Jesus saw to the unique value of every single individual, male, female, whatever background, didn't matter. Remember, this was the same Jesus who said, let the children come to me, after the disciples said, give him space. And Jesus said, no, let the children come to me. So Jesus goes against the conventional wisdom of the day in identifying people with specific needs at specific times that need healing in their life at that exact moment. In other words, it mattered to Jesus what you thought of yourself. It mattered to Jesus what these people thought about themselves. Because we live in a world that doesn't often practice affirmation and sometimes it's pretty fake anyway. Psychiatrists, sociologists, psychiatrists, your own doctor, a good personal officer. All of them realize that it's crucial, a good teacher. All of them realize it's crucial what you believe about yourself because the lies that you believe that have been told about you will eventually translate into a lifestyle far below what God has planned for you. The problem maybe is that the world has used false standards to measure worth for forever. Uh, the first false standard that would be an obvious one would be material things. You know, so uh, I just need to get to that car. I just need to get to that house. I just need to get to that area. I just need to get to that job. I just need to get that promotion. I just, I can hear it's going to carry on going. Because every time you strive, there's something more ahead of you. What happens when those material things are taken away? What happens if you pride yourself? I pride myself, I prided myself on my health. I was physically strong. I was extremely fit. I broke my neck. It slows you down. You lose that confidence. But you can lose anything. I think of one of our great ministers who, brilliant mind, fantastic guy, but he had dementia for the last few years of his life. And, and it's almost like that tragic side of a bright person who now no longer has the ability to remember and clear, think clearly. Um, your company could close down. You might be fired. Every single thing that you have that's based on materialistic values can be taken away. Ask the people of Houston when you see Boeing 747s underwater. Ask the people in when the Twin Towers crashed down. Things can be taken away. So the second thing that would, so material, let's take that away for a moment. Let's now say, what about, and we move into, oh, other people's expectations. Hear the sentence, you'll work it out for yourself. It sounds strange, but you'll work it out. I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. And as you unpack it, what it translates to is, I try to fulfill what I think you expect of me. So I become a people pleaser. The trouble is, one, I don't actually know what you want of me anyway. 
And even if I did, would I be true to myself? I'd be faking it, wouldn't I? And live up to your expectations. That's great. That's fantastic. So Philip lives up to Gertrude's expectations. That's not going to happen. I find worth to, to living up to God's expectations. So if we had the material standard, has Jesus passed or failed the material standard test of worth? He's failed. He had a robe to be divided when he died. What else did he have? I don't see anything. How many times did Jesus try to live up to other people's expectations? He might have known what they were thinking at least. But did he or did he tell the truth? But in the right way. So, the first one is material wealth, which can fool me, or academic ability, or anything in that range. The second thing that can catch me is trying to live up to other people's expectations. That's the second one. The third one are the experiences of life. The experiences of life that you have been through. I don't know what each person here has a unique story. Um, the one I spoke about this morning um, was um, my one friend shot himself in a safe, a walking safe in the pharmacy. And I'd been with him two days before and I knew something was wrong, but I didn't ask the right question. Ten years later, I was praying with a guy at Parents Who Care. It's when parents go into the children's schools and pray before the day starts for the staff for the children. I knew something was wrong with John. I didn't know what it was, but he was also often introverted. I found out five hours later that John shot himself off to the prayer meeting. And I totally blamed myself at one point. Because I said, Philip, if you could have only drawn and worked out where these people were, what they were going to do. And I lived with that guilt for forever. In fact, actually, when John shot himself and I heard over the phone, I screamed. There's an animal scream, I believe, in each one of us when our hearts are torn asunder. So I lived much of my life regretting that I hadn't been able to save my two friends' lives. Then again, God didn't put me on earth to be a savior. True standards, true standards of worth, if there were identical twins in this church today, I'd ask them to stand up and I'd say, what's different between them? And you'd say, no, they're identical twins. And I'd say, check their fingerprints. They are unique. They may look exactly the same. They may even have the same inflections and, and body language. But their fingerprints are different because God's made each person unique. You are a gift of the Creator. You're the pinnacle. Right here, whatever you believe about yourself, you are the pinnacle of God's creation. When He'd done everything else, and He painted the colors in the sky, and He painted the rainbow, and He painted the stars at night, and He placed each and every planet where it needed to be, He then made you. And me. Keith, you still here? May I tell my tinkle story? Thank you. So, when we were in Matat, I mentioned at one of the services that I love animals. And so, the next day, a cardboard box was outside our door with two kittens in it. And these were ugly kittens. <laughs> you have never met such ugly cats in your life. 
except those hairless ones. Oh, that's disgusting. Anyway, but socks and tinkle. Yes, socks, because she had white feet. Okay, yes, we all know. But now, Tinkle thought she was a dog. She was a cog. Or a dat. Work it out for yourself. <laughs> and I used to, and I used to be coming back, and I used to be a K away from home, and Tinkle would hear me and come running down to the gate to wait for me. Then she just caught me up. Then she just caught me back inside. And she always forgot that I closed the middle gate and then had to squeeze under it. <laughs> One time, I was doing a, a baptism. It was a midweek baptism in the evening. And it was simply in the evening because people were crossing flights from one country, one continent to another. And we had their family just for that short period of time altogether. And I was doing the baptism. So I was doing it at night, unusual. Obviously, I'm not going to be standing back there. So I was nice and close. And I was talking to the folks. And we were with just a small little group. The next minute, everybody starts laughing. Okay. What had happened is my cog, or my dat, had gone to sleep on the pulpit and had woken up and went, meow. <laughs> it was so cool. But what gave Tinkle value? She was loved. Simplest answer in the world. What transforms your birth? if you're loved. So now get back to the foundations of the gospel. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's love. You're worth an inestimable amount God made you, and he loves you. Shall we pray? Father, as we think through this idea of being uniquely loved, uniquely cared for, being precious in your sight, it doesn't matter what qualifications we have, doesn't matter what job we hold, doesn't matter how strong or weak, or, it doesn't matter but we are the pinnacle of your creation. To God be the glory. Great things he's done. Including each and every one of us. And we thank you for that Lord. We thank you that we have value. Because your son died. To show us just how much. In Jesus name. Amen.